sing your favorite Stargate song. Stargate, talking about Stargate, (laughs) something about Stargate, there's Egyptians. To your inner child is an idiot, the podcast where we look back on things from our childhood and see if they're any good. My name is CJ. And I'm Damon. Hello, My DJ. goal is to get it out in less breath each episode. <laughs> Mission accomplished. I can't wait until you <laughs> pass out when we're reviewing Half Baked. I have two questions for you. <laughs> wow. Number right one. At the start. Number yeah, one. go ahead. I'm ready. Okay. One period and parenthesis. Go. Do you think uh, aliens built the pyramids? <laughs> no, dumb. Uh, two, period, and parenthesis. Go. Two, have you seen Stargate? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exclamation point. We were talking uh, about Stargate, the Ridge, the, the movie, 1994? I want to say. Oh, that sounds, that seems like you, you're, you're close. You may not have 50 points from the bullseye, but you probably got like 20 points. We've got Kurt. Kurt Russell, yeah, James Spader, Mm -hmm. and uh, Roland Emmerich. Is he? uh, Question mark. Is he in charge here? This feels like a Roland Emmerich joint. I think this is this is one of his. This was his first uh, dipping the toe into destroying landmarks. Wouldn't destroy the Earth's pyramids by no means, but he would destroy some foreign planets' pyramids. Yeah, so what's the deal? They discover a portal, basically, right? Yeah, I've seen I mean, this, I prefer the term Stargate. I prefer the term Stargate. Just, you know, just how I was raised, I call them Stargates. But you can call them Is portals. it an Einstein Rosen Bridge, would you say? Is that <laughs> the yeah, theoretically uh, yeah, probably one of them. Wormhole? Probably one of them. A few of those. To uh, a different... Maybe a rainbow bridge in there as well. Is it to another planet or is it to like a dimension? I don't remember. I, I think believe it must be it's to, to another planet. I believe it's to another planet. Yeah, because okay. So, did you ever watch the the show SG One? No. That no. stands for Stargate One. Thanks for clearing that up, you guys. <laughs> Stargate colon SG One. Yeah, just in case there's more that. Stargates to come. I never, Des- I never despite- watched that one because I think it's a Showtime show, and so I never really had oh. Showtime. I'm surprised I didn't watch it, given that it had MacGyver, Richard Dean Anderson. Mac- you love him, MacGyver all over it. Mm-hmm. A Mac, MacGyver does MacGyver. McGyvin? McGyvin? I'm trying to I remember, think what else to say uh, about this. I remember this was one of these weird movies that was in a state of limbo in my household. My brother, always with an eye towards his career and his future, studied art history yes. and had a passion for Egyptology <laughs> as, sure. as a teen. And this was a weird movie in that we wouldn't... Jason, we wouldn't, you're a delight. <laughs> We would dare not buy it. We would never buy it on VHS or Doi Vidoi, but we would rent it frequently from the video <laughs> store so that we could watch it. And that's what we, that was the choice that we made. And so we, we would rent Stargate a lot. And it was one of those movies also that, that you would never choose to watch it, but if it was on on a Saturday afternoon, which it frequently was i feel like it was one of those mm. type movies that wasn't a huge hit so you you, you feel like the network could buy them fairly cheaply they, and then they got that TNT every money, saturday though. for the rest yeah. of existence <laughs> we watched it a lot like you would stumble upon it and then you're like well i have to watch this until completion so, i wish i, okay. I wish i phrased it better <laughs> was it get, it got you there is that what you're saying <laughs> a little um, this, uh rd rd anderson uh <laughs> assist there Richard Dean, a- not Richard Dean Anderson. He's not in the movie. <laughs> Kurt Russell's in this movie. Okay, in well, the Richard I Dean mean, Anderson role, I assume. You're like, I was watching the movie, but I was picturing Richard Dean Anderson. <laughs> and then when they made the show, I was like, good eye on it. Well done. Uh, <laughs> Hold on. I'm also looking up the guy who is in this. He's probably more famous for being in the <laughs> transphobic role in the crying game. Oh, Jay Davidson oh. Uh, plays the sun god Ra, who's our villain. Okay. 
Uh, I remember, I feel like I cannot place what the actual plot of this movie is. They go to another planet and then sort of realize that ancient Egypt's culture was based on this alien planet's culture and that maybe an alien in the guise of Ra came down to Egypt, sort of forming Mm. their pantheon of gods. And also, James Spader plays, uh, I'm not going to lie, a very symmetrical comely nerd who is studying... He's like the Egyptologist guy, right? right? exactly. Like, yeah. And he I mean, Kurt Russell's he like learns, the military guy. He learns a more... Uh, he's able to sort of figure out their language because it's sort of... It's, of course, its root is ancient Egyptian. And there's a pretty, pretty lass, a pretty space Egyptian lass <laughs> that he falls for. <laughs> but space I can't Egyptian figure lass. out what, what actually happens. They like stumble upon a small village and then like Ra's space pyramid descends. The more I say it, the more I sound completely deranged. <laughs> so I feel like this will either be terrible or great. I feel like this is your... Like, for me, this is a quintessential dad movie. Like, I, I, and it's, it, I don't even know if my dad especially Take likes that, this Jason. movie. But I feel like this, I th- think of this movie and I think that's like, that's something that my dad would watch. And maybe it's just because it's that Saturday afternoon on TV. He's asleep on the couch, where, the football game's over, yeah. and Stargate came on. <laughs> He's like half, wa- he's just sitting there watching and it's like, if you turned the TV to another channel, he almost wouldn't notice. He's just sort of like happy to be sitting, relaxing for a day, sitting and staring at the TV. And you're like, now it's Home Shopping Network. And he's like, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Whatever I don't know, will I, lull I, me to sleep. But I don't know if I have uh, much more to say about this. Ooh, this Kurt either. Russell's character has a tragic backstory. Ooh. But doesn't he also have one of those uh, jaunty military hats? I know. So. That's what sort of undercuts the tragic backstory. He has a little <laughs> jaunty cap. Kind of comes out in the wash then, doesn't it, Kurt? <laughs> Six and one half dozen of the ever. Uh, it sort of bounces out. You take the good, you take the bad. You take them both, and now you have a nice hat. <laughs> We're going to watch Stargate. Watch along with us. We'll be right back. Hey, uh, DJ. <laughs> Sorry, I just ran into you here in the middle of the podcast. That oh, we record. oh, hey, hey. Yeah, what did you... you just get back from D'Agostino's, pick up a baguette and some celery? That's the stuff peeking out of the top of your grocery bag. Uh, I wanted to talk to you, uh, talk to you about two things. Um, one, yeah. how mm-hmm. gorgeous is James Spader's hair in the movie Stargate? Oh. Open parenthesis, 1994, end parenthesis. Flowing locks. Oh my God, so gorgeous too. Have you been to your inner child is an idiot dot com to support this podcast? Your inner child is an idiot. Now that's a. Uh, it's like a, a it's a, a radio hypertext program. Tran- it's a hypertext transfer protocol website. Okay. okay. To support a radio program that you don't listen to on the radio, you listen okay. to in a phone. But they used to be called pods, and so they're called podcasts because oh, you're casting call them? them across space and time. Much in the same format as the Stargate of. I thought of it was this because film. we mostly discuss legumes, <laughs> like a broadcast about legumes. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, you know, I, I, I like that you've pitched that idea three or four times. Uh, I told you I'm not doing it, uh, mostly because of my son Tucker's peanut allergy. Um, <laughs> But uh, I hope the people listening will go to your uh, And uh, if they like this, they can donate uh, to our Patreon. If they don't like it, they can donate even more money to get us to stop. What if that was the top tier? $100 a month and we won't do a podcast. And we are back. <laughs> we are through the Stargate of time. Wait, did we agree on Stargate? Because I've been calling it a portal of time this whole time. Mm, portal de tiempo. That's, that's a direct tiempo. translation. So we watch a Stargate 1994. Want to be just right up front honest with you. I watched it on YouTube with ads. <laughs> Wouldn't recommend that viewing experience for many reasons. One, the ads. Two, 
<laughs> we discovered that there's a large there's large blocks of period of time where people are speaking in the dialect of the what are the people called? I don't think they're ever called. Okay, but they it's a they speak a uh, version of Egyptian that of, is yeah, spoken by Egyptian. no one in the real world. Yeah, YouTube. When they were like, yeah, go ahead and upload this movie. We don't care. We're going to throw some ads on there. One of the things they didn't throw on there was <laughs> subtitles for this language that no one speaks. Probably because no one speaks it, I guess. And they didn't uh, have a script handy. So they were like, we'll skip this part. Turns out, at first, I, I started, Lauren and I were like, okay, I guess you're just supposed to use context clues. But then, after a couple minutes, <laughs> we're like, I think we're supposed to have subtitles. It this felt is about, like something was missing. This is about halfway through the movie at this point. What, like 50, 60% into the movie? Yeah. It becomes very clear that you need to understand what they're saying. There are whole swaths of conversations between the antagonist and the protagonist, uh, two ancillary characters who are explaining what happened, where there's just no yeah. text. Luckily... The good people and probably some of the bad people of the internet have made the script available so that you can read it to your loved one in whatever <laughs> wacky voices you want. Or if you've already had an argument about the film, in very short, <laughs> staccato line readings. <laughs> so just so you guys are, if you decide to go back and watch this movie, and we'll tell you what, what we think about that, just be forewarned, you might not want to go that route unless you want the... F- you may want to get a Showtime subscription. Yeah. <laughs> you may want to go into your uh, DVD, your dad's DVD collection to get Stargate <laughs> 1994. Okay. Damon, please recap this movie. Whoa. Just really uh, twist. Listen, I poorly recapped all of the Lord of the Rings movie. It's your turn. I feel like that was a, you. And you by thing. your turn. <laughs> that was like to show you could do it. And by your turn, I mean you do 90% of the recaps. Thank you. Um, Percentages in this episode. (laughs) So this movie opens on uh, opening credits ripped straight from 1989's Batman, where you follow along the, I don't know, the head of Ra, like a sarcophagus Mm. head. Mm Mm-hmm. We get into one of my favorite racist conspiracy theories that aliens help build the pyramids. Uh, James Spader is explaining that. The Egyptians couldn't do it. (laughs) Africans? It had to be space aliens that I guess just like left suddenly and never contacted the human race again because, I don't know, merchandising rights, they were mad about that. I Like, why would they just suddenly disappear? Why would they build these structures and then leave? Ooh. Anyway, James Spader seems to be a proponent of that. Mm-hmm. He's giving a talk where people are walking out. He gets stopped by this old lady um, <laughs> who uh, wants to hire him onto a ooh, secret project. Spoiler alert, the secret, secret project is the oh, Stargate. Shit. But he doesn't know that yet because he's just translating these big stones they found and they can't tell him because it's top secret stuff about the actual Stargate. They're just talking about the stones. And the stones have normal uh, Cartouchian <laughs> hieroglyphics on them, except there's six symbols on there, possibly seven, that don't look to be uh, normal hieroglyphics mm. at all. Comic legend Richard Kind is there for reasons. <laughs> Mrs. Sokol from that, uh, that episode stretch of Seinfeld, she's there too. Love to see her. Kurt Russell's there. He's an army guy. Anyway, they figure out that this is a space portal uh, that can create a wormhole through... Now, is there another is there another word for a space portal? I feel like there's a snappier um, name for that. You know what? Thank you. Uh, it's called a planet door. Door uh, into there. There. A uh, there door. Uh, it's called a stargate as we... Uh, uh, the okay, titular okay, gate. Okay, okay. You know, they find out that this will send them across the known galaxy. They end up in a place with a bunch of ancient Egyptians what? in it. What? What a world. A bunch of space Egyptians. And uh, then they find out that Ra, the sun god Ra, was actually an alien who kidnapped a young Egyptian boy uh, to possess his body and then live mm-hmm. forever. For in ways, in, yes. in, in superior in, technology, in technological yeah. ways that we all know about, and the movie doesn't feel the need to explain. Yeah. And uh, it turns out he's been enslaving uh, these ancient space Egyptians to, to... mine, uh, mostly to mm-hmm. mine, uh, sort of the area for things for the for the mineral that, that he uses need. to build stargates to get, even though there just seems to be to one get the people that he already has. I guess I have to get more people eventually. Yeah. I don't know. Don't worry about it. He's bad. He 
he's a real big dick. You know, James Spader uh, eventually starts to learn how to talk to the space Egyptians. Uh, he falls in love with them with one of them and accidentally marries her inadvertently. And uh, Kurt Russell, still reeling from the death of his son, uh, decides he's going, he's doing a suicide mission. He's going to, once they are able to get back to earth, he's going to stay, blow up the Stargate so nothing can ever get through again. The point is they decide to kill Ra with the bomb anyway. And uh, that's the end of that. So they lead like some sort of revolution. This is one of the worst recaps I've ever Don't done. forget uh, James Spader's character stays. He's like, I found oh, this yeah. woman whose language I sort of speak, and uh, I've known her for about, I want to say, 16 hours at this point. So mm-hmm, I'm going to stay mm-hmm, here. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to stay here. I'm going to abandon everything I have back home, even though the first scene did establish that he has, he was a foster kid, so thus he has no uh, connection to, <laughs> to the world that he lives in. A little backstory um, for and, you. Uh, you know, he meets a woman who can't speak uh, his own language. And immediately and so offers herself to him. Yeah. Right? Uh, because of patriarchy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, there's another here and there. And then they blow up the, the planar pyramids and uh, it's they go back home. I want a sans spader. I want to be a rich enigmatic someday. I want to be like, <laughs> get in. To someone just within my like town car or my limo, and then someone, you know, some young talented person. Like I don't know. It depends on what my my quest is. What you know? I the old lady. I do. She seems very nice, but uh, she's introduced by first a completely unimportant scene where it's like three minutes long, and it shows her buying a necklace in ancient Egypt, or not in ancient Egypt, in 1928 yeah. Egypt, and then. Her father, who's an Egyptologist, finds the Stargate. It's literally a three-minute yeah. scene that she explains later on in the movie anyway. It seemed like an excuse to, like, go to Egypt and film a yeah. scene. Then, uh, But she she seems very nice, except she, she approaches James Spader, like you said, by, like, driving up and saying, are these your foster parents? <laughs> and he's like, it's just like, why don't you offer the job to him rather than, you know, just sort of being vaguely creepy? <laughs> Don't just like open with, uh, oh, uh, this picture I have. Are these your parents? You have nothing but what's in your suitcases. What a great job interview. <laughs> How about, do you, love, do you love to win or hate to lose? That's a job interview question. Not, are these your parents? <laughs> How about, what are your strengths and weaknesses? What would you say your biggest weakness is? That's a question. That's an interview question right there. Anyway, uh, that's when she hires him for this uh, job that I also was very confused about because it, she seems like a private investor who, ha- who owns these objects, quote-unquote, stolen from ancient Egypt. But then the government comes in and just takes over the project? How does that work? Mm. The movie isn't interested in me asking <laughs> these questions. So, I mean, the first part of this movie, there's part of it me that appreciates it because I think like trying to explain it yeah. would just make yeah. a a much more boring experience. But the fact that they just cruise through this whole uh, first third I do on feel like, like Earth, this... or not even a third, I would say it's a fifth of the movie, just as like yeah. first setup, so that like get to the space fight and it's but just so quick. I do feel like they're they're skipping up a, a part because I think in an ideal world, you as the creators of this film would understand the yada yada parts. But that doesn't mean you have to piece by piece explain every bit of it to the audience. You can kind of infer and jump forward to kind of move the story along, I think. But at the same time, there's, it's clearly, there's a fine line between that, between knowing and not, you know, just kind of showing the, the, the bullet points and not getting into the stick, sticky details. Cause it's not, you know, we'll get into that in the novelization of Stargate, um, <laughs> but, or the 11 spinoff series. But like, it also seems more like the, the other razor's edge part of this, which is where if you ask too many questions, it starts to fall apart. You're like poking holes in it a little bit too easily. Mm -hmm. Also the biggest mystery we get right away when Jackson is whisked to the military base, which is where the, the Stargate thing is. And as soon as he's rolling in through those, those security gates, you see just a random military vehicle smoke. The engine is smoking and like a, a, like a, a soldier is like waving smoke away. It's like a lo- It's a far away shot. <laughs> How did it's I like, miss it's, that? It's a long shot. Like it's a wide shot. And, and it's like, 
wait, what the fuck is going on over there? And why is this important? <laughs> why is that you're back? Like, I don't know if it was an extra, just, just kind of trying to have his moment or like what was going on? What if it was legitimate car troubles and Roland Emmerich could just, just the last day of filming. He's like, I just want to get it done. Why is Richard kind in this movie? <laughs> it's a great question. You can't, uh, we've been watching Richard the, kind. You can't just be the other in movies. Two? <laughs> We've been watching the other two, which he plays the agent of one of the characters mm. in it, who also happens to be an Uber driver and an Uber Eats deliverer <laughs> and a, possibly a barber, according <laughs> to other characters in it. Uh, but it was very distracting to be like in the middle of watching the other two and then turning on Stargate one day. I'm like, there's fucking Richard Kind again. All of my favorite quotes come from the the very first act, like the first part of the first act of this movie, because we got... James Spader's character, what is his name? Jackson something. James Spader is, uh, it's Jack. His last name yeah. is Jackson. I can't remember his Daniel, Daniel Jackson, yeah. Daniel. Daniel, Daniel to quote Charlie. So, uh, in the beginning, Jackson is being sort of like whisked into this, this science lab in a military base. And, and then people are just like, are immediately like showering him with information. And then you have this woman that starts speaking to him and then she goes, Barbara Shore. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also had a lot of similar lines, uh, not intentionally funny, but I, I liked them. Uh, probably the darkest one I liked is that when we were introduced to Kurt Russell's character, two men from the military, you can tell for they're from the military because they're wearing military clothes. Um, they're called uniforms. They arrive at his house. <laughs> they're called costumes. They, uh, they're called military jumpers, and they come with these fun pins. Collect them all. <laughs> they they enter his house in the <laughs> the most ludicrous scene, <laughs> where they walk in and they're like, "Can we talk to Captain O'Neill or whatever his rank is?" I didn't even pay attention to my, that much. And his wife is just washing dishes. Her back is to the camera. She stops washing dishes to light a cigarette, and she goes, "You can try." <laughs> and I'm like. It's weird to light a cigarette while washing dishes with the ashes fall into your, your dishwater. Then they go into the house where Kurt Russell is sitting. And this is before he gets his Sergeant Guile haircut. Right. He's got long flowing locks. He's got a gun in his hands. He's sitting in his son's bedroom. Uh, the knock is at the door from the military guys. And he hides the gun under the pillow. And... They're like, you've been reinstated or whatever. And they, the military guys go to their car, sans Kurt Russell. He'll catch up. And they go, what happened to him? Or how'd he get like that? And one of the guys goes, his kid died. And I'm like, no shit, <laughs> movie. I, it's like the movie was not, uh, they were like, uh, I'm 85% sure that everyone will understand what happened here. But just to be absolutely sure, let's just have someone make a declarative <laughs> sentence where they say, his kid his died. Kid shot himself. Yeah, his kid shot himself, which plays into the movie almost like a wisp of flavor in a LaCroix. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's almost there. It's kind of an element in this movie. I've actually seen this movie maybe 10 times, and this is the first time I picked up on the fact that he's so sensitive about all the uh, the space Egyptians having guns because his son shot himself accidentally. I just thought I was like, I probably wouldn't want a bunch of people who've never seen a gun before to hold yeah. a gun. It's just a natural yeah. reaction. It's a, it, I don't even want people who've been trained on guns to have guns. They don't know what it is, and he's making it clear to them that it's dangerous, which I think is a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it was just a weird... My other no-shit moment was when the Stargate gets turned on, and it's like... <laughs> and the big, you know, abyss special yeah. effects are in the middle of it. Someone calls down to the, the control center and says, record, record all the information from the Stargate. I'm like, what the fuck do you think we're doing here, you jackass? We've got like 60 people on staff. Everyone's got their own fucking computer. It's 1994, and everyone's got their own computer. Think about that. Of course we're recording information from the Stargate. If don't call down here with bullshit instructions like that. We're recording everything. Fuck off. I, do, I mean, I like that they get right to it because it's the point of the movie, but also like he Jackson walks in and they're like, let's do this. And they like spin up the Stargate. <laughs> it's like, whoa, I don't even I they pull the just saw on this it. for the first time. But yeah. hold on. I'm just gonna Yeah, he figures out. It does out, look like a um, speak and the spell, thing by they've the been way. struggling with. <laughs> The cow goes. It's losing its batteries. Um, 
<laughs> or you put your finger on the arrow so it can't pros- <laughs> you know go properly. <laughs> I did like, yeah, he figures out the the weird uh, hieroglyphs that are actually like three uh, seconds. graphic depictions of constellations, and which also seems like, I feel like Egyptologists, I mean, I feel like that would be one of the first things you'd start to go, like people have been mapping yeah, the skies You're looking for. through the lens of history. <laughs> I guess so. Egyptians were known for just staring at the ground all the time. They were so they were so self conscious. They just rarely looked up. Yeah, it's a, that's my sad. favorite thing when it's sad. Like, all these places on Earth from ancient times line up with the stars, and it was like, yeah, they saw the stars. <laughs> we have, do you think future people are going to look at it and be like, they had these different telescopes at different places. They must all be connected by aliens. It's like, no, they have the same technology. The technology being yes. eyes. <laughs> uh, hold on. I just wanted to say, yeah, so he figures out the constellations thing. And they're like, oh, it's constellations? Well, let's just put that in. Boop, boop, boop. And the Stargate starts going. They've got like a robot ready to go. Like he's just around. He's like in the hallway waiting for this moment. Send the robot in. They get the transmission from the robot in two seconds. But he's across the galaxy. Went through the Stargate. I don't know shit about shit. But I know it took so much time before those pictures of Pluto came back. No, like the, I know enough that I'm like the information's Come coming on. through the Stargate. It's right there. He's like, is that I'm the gonna idea? Say it is. I don't think the movie explains that. But all right. Well, it was still. And then they by 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 the afternoon after a hearty lunch, they were shooting <laughs> people straight through the Stargate. You're, you missed uh, two of my favorite quotes, which are from the the <laughs> like basically O'Neill's boss or rank the rank above O'Neill. I don't know C- Colonel <laughs> Jessup or whatever, played by Leon Rippey. Yeah. Uh, and he says, freeze and enhance. <laughs> <laughs> he was, uh, he was, um, I don't know if he was a good grumpy general, uh, but he definitely was a grumpy general and uh, often just glowered at people in a very uh, Ron Swanson type He also way. said, I, complete I'm, with Walrus. I'm trying mustache. to remember how he says it because I just put it in quotes at it, but he says it in a really funny way, which is, you're on the team. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's he's like, do you think you can translate them? And uh, you know, James Spader is like, I don't know, absolutely, lady, nice lady with the Egypt and the things, <laughs> Anubis maybe, <laughs> scarab beetle even. Uh, <laughs> Wait, that's more Bill Cosby uh, than anything. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> problematic. Whereas Jerry Lewis, <laughs> no problem. Thumbs up. Ludicrous. One, I was relieved once we finally got to space Egypt because I was like, whew, that was <laughs> now if I had spent like just five more minutes in earth with these, just shooting people across the galaxies experiments, I was going to, well, plus you wanted out. to experience the very nineties wormhole that they went through and then <laughs> French Stewart. So you were ready for those experiences. I, I was when I saw French Stewart's name in the credits and I, I blurted it out. I you know you know I'm a big fan. Oh yeah. So uh, I was Francophile. They call you excited. <laughs> 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 I've been an old. I'm an old French Stewart fan. You could even call me uh, uh, a gall. A gall. You can call me a gall. I'm such an Jesus old French Christ. Stewart fan. Okay, French Stewart is in this movie, looking pretty ripped. Ripped for French Stewart. Well, yeah. I mean, it's not like he's jacked. He's just no, like he's, got no body fat. He's just on. looking like <laughs> he's just looking like a like a soldier in a tank top. I gotta I gotta say, they're immediately so they go through the, the Stargate and James Spader's job. The reason he's coming with them is so that he can help them get back because they can't. It's a one way Stargate. I guess I got that from the, the, the first part. Did you get that from the first part that his job was to then immediately send them back once they arrive? Yeah. Yeah. And then he gets, who didn't get that information. Can you name one person who didn't understand that that was their job? Uh, James Peter's character, Daniel Jackson (laughs) goes there and was like, well, I can't uh, get you back. There's we're missing the seventh symbol. It's like, what? 
Couldn't you have turned the robot around to look at the Stargate to see if you had all the symbols? <laughs> In his defense, everyone did bring suitcases, tents, food, a giant robot full of supplies uh, on the way. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I sometimes need to have instructions told to me several times before, you know, they really sink in. So maybe he just, like, inferred from all this other evidence we're camp- that they were, we're going for a long time. We're going camping. Uh, that that uh, they weren't just popping in, sticking their heads around the corner, and then popping back into the Stargate. Was this the era of the Fifth Avenue bar? Like, was Fifth Avenue bar like a... a... <laughs> was this peak Fifth Avenue? <laughs> yeah. Was this the... Was... What is a Fifth Avenue bar? It's... I think it's like toffee with chocolate on it and maybe caramel. There's not five elements in it? Because that's a missed opportunity. I think you're thinking of take five. Ooh, love a take five. Let's see. Fifth Avenue bar. Fifth Avenue bar. Nope, that's... Okay, here we go. Peanut butter crunch layers enrobed in chocolate. Enrobed? Enrobed. Hmm. Similar to a Clark bar. I'm sorry, I wasn't listening because I was too busy uh, catching and robed. Uh, what was it again? It's a peanut butter crunch layers and robed. Mm. Does that does Fifth Avenue still exist? I think so, but how is that different from a Butterfinger? Or Butterfinger is something else. Butterfinger. Butterfinger is peanut brittle. I mean, Butterfingers have the texture of a uh, fungus toenail inside, covered in chocolate. They're disgusting. I hate them so much. We should do a we should do a candy bar episode. Speaking of things that you hate. <laughs> what, what you want is a... I like a lot of them. I just hate Butterfingers, and I don't understand... Uh, I think I was tricked by commercials into thinking they were cool, because I love The Simpsons, and so, you know, thus Bart Simpson's always Nobody trying to tell me lay a finger, finger off his Butterfinger. Um, but I find them gross and disgusting. And I'm like, what is this supposed to be? Just tell... I'm, I have a wide latitude on accepting like fake flavors as real flavors but what is a butterfinger supposed to be just tell me so i can pretend that's that it's that's what peanut it butter like. toffee crunch False. thing it's grotesque it feels like dead skin and covered <laughs> in chocolate well you would make a very bad uh egyptian space cow <laughs> bantha isn't this a bantha it feels like it, a bantha. it does kind of yeah so they they immediately start feeding alien creatures people food you're not even supposed to feed earth creatures people food <laughs> <laughs> don't they haven't they seen the studies where sugar is as bad as cocaine they, those, as addictive as was cocaine. 1994 that wasn't discovered yet no we were like oh, you need the sugar to do your exercises yeah. They're like, that's how you get the... Have a cigarette uh, and a bag of sugar. (laughs) (sighs) President Dwight D. Eisenhower just (laughs) fell prone to Monica Lewinsky. Um, See, because it was the 90s, but... I want to say, for for people that didn't watch this yet, this movie has a very, like, event movie feel. It has a very, like... I mean, it's Roland Emmerich. It's one of his earliest joints, right? Maybe his breakout. This was, I think, his first big movie. Yeah. Yeah. And it has that sort of event movie Spielberg quality to it. He's got the orchestral music, and it's got a very, like, jaunty, we're going on an adventure vibe to it. And I really appreciate that. I just want to say that. So if you're, no, I we're mean, immediately making fun of this movie warranted, but like, I was immediately <laughs> like, oh, this is like, you know, you know, I feel, and maybe that's just an era nostalgia thing, but like when you watch the, the original Star Wars trilogy, you watch Indiana Jones, you watch the, like almost any of the like 80s Spielberg things, you feel like we're like, we're here at the movies. We're queer. We're seeing <laughs> We're here. We're <laughs> queer. We have some beer. <laughs> and we're searing movies. Uh, no, I, 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 I got that feeling. It definitely had a vibe of uh, the last third of E.T. when the military yeah. comes in and tries to kill E.T. Right. And Indiana Jones, um, that sort Archaeology of... Archaeology uh, plus punching. You got to figure out the code of the, the, yeah. the hieroglyphs. We uh, need Indiana a symbologist. Vibe. Yeah. <laughs> Give me Robert Langdon, a.k.a. Daniel Jackson. Ta- Tyler did uh, did cite, uh, is this Dan Brown before Dan Brown? I'm like, it's a little Dan <laughs> it's a Brown. Little. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And when that, um, when Ra's space pyramid landed on the yeah. pyramid on another planet, <laughs> so an extraterrestrial pyramid covered by a space pyramid, are you with me? It's like a pyramid as a pyramid hat. 
It's a pyramid sheath to protect your pyramid. <laughs> you can't... Have you seen the pyramids in Egypt? They don't have pyramid sheaths. And they're all weathered, and their rocks are falling apart. You want a pyramid sheath. Fits neatly on top they of your pyramid. They did used to have stone yeah. surfaces. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm just saying. Learn your Egypt- Egyptology before you <laughs> make jokes. I was going to say, when that landed, uh, it reminded me... I mean, I was like, oh, right. This is the guy who did an Independence Day like, right. two years later. Yeah. And it had a very, like, that big ship coming over yeah. New York City. And that they also... That the same vibe. Like, it sends out, like, little Pil- pew, pew, Pillsbury pew. Crescent roll-shaped <laughs> ships, <laughs> which are very reminiscent of the ID4 mm-hmm. yeah, Independence Day ships as well. Which I think, you know... And they also, I, like, did they... Oh, don't remind me that they tried to make ID4 a thing. <laughs> did they have... They keep showing over and over again. They show their weapons, like, open up a little bit and mm-hmm. then shoot, a little... like, a beam. Yeah. And, like, the ships do it. They're, they're, like, staff guns do it. And every time they shoot them, they show them, like... Quick. It's like if they... Sh- in a Western, every time they showed the, like, chamber moving on a six gun, it's like, you don't... Yeah. You don't need to, does this, is this important? I thought for sure it was going to be important later because they showed it so many times, but it was not. It was just like they found a shot that they liked. You, you thought it was Chekhov's staff. Of yeah. Gun. I mean, they do, the good guys do use that. I mean, it was definitely Chekhov's teleportation device, beam, mm-hmm. beam mm-hmm. cylinders, <laughs> the beam slinky. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 I I think it's just I uh, I I know what you mean and I can see how I think it's just like a tension builder like yeah. like like cocking a gun okay. almost yeah. more than than watching the the barrel uh shift every time but it's like cocking it's like it's dumb like it doesn't really make sense <laughs> just fire it or don't fire but stop sitting here pointing it at me rudely <laughs> I want to talk about how different energy young spader brings versus old spader I'm so I've been so used to seeing him recently. I I never watched the the blacklist, but I've seen the commercials for it. And I've also I saw him in The Office, who's voiced Ultron in the Age of Ultron, and then he's been in some other somewhat l- more recent things. What Boston Legal a few years ago? I watched. A lot oh, of that. my brother loved Boston. I watched Legal. and loved and loved Blacklist. I believe maybe my brother's a big Spader fan. Maybe, but. It's not just that he's older and and more bloated as we all are, but it's also that just the energy as an actor he brings is so much different now than then. And it's like it's not just I mean some of it's just the role obviously, but he he's so and I, this movie is definitely the tail end of early age of early era Spader, you know, cuz he was like big in the 80s and he had that sort of like it's like smarmy isn't he a prick? Like, like, isn't yeah. he like a prick in a? Is it less than zero or maybe not that? Maybe he's he's like the bad guy in a yeah '80s movie, right? Like the yeah. rich kid. Yeah, I get him a little confused with Andrew Shu in the '80s. Like they both kind of have that that same kind of look. But I think I think James Spader was always more of a dick. He, I mean, he has that vibe, and I think he's sort of grown into that. Like here, he's playing like. Very, very nerdy, very sort of Weasley. Uh, he's, I mean, he, you could almost say like he's a little bit on the spectrum. Like he doesn't really pick up on cues very well. Uh, he seems kind of awkward, yeah. you know, talking to people. He doesn't maintain eye contact very well. I mean, it's a really, I mean, I feel like I like this character yeah. a lot. And I think that everything that's likable about this character is James Spader bringing it to it. Because I think on paper, this character, aside from having allergies, is like bare, like a wisp of a character. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I think that James Spader gives him some very specific characteristics that like make him feel really lived in and real and and he does really do a good job now later career i agree like later career james spader has really leaned in on the smarmy side of things oddly yeah. menacing yeah. but he like doesn't know he's trying to be menacing perhaps right <laughs> characters like johnny california from yeah. the office blacklist i think he's like an ex-con who's like helping the police like almost like a a non-cannibalistic cannibal lector type <laughs> deal and Ultron, you know, I think he had uh, some good intentions. Yeah. <laughs> Who, Ultron? Not for the good people of Segovia, oh, yeah. but uh, otherwise. <laughs> Was that the name of the fake S- country? Segovia, I think. I love Zagovia. fake countries in movies. Segovia is a uh, guitarist. Andrew Zoo. 
he originally they were just going to launch him into the air. And they were like, what if more people were in danger? Because it just seems the one weird guy. for the entire Avengers to like, I mean, we, of course, we don't want him to die. Yeah. But I mean, but just. Seems a lot of, like, Iron Man can send handle. Send War Machine for that. We don't need the whole team. So. War Machine second string. <laughs> we don't even need the A squad for this. Iron Man, if you, you know what? You already, you already asked off. I'm not going to, I'm not going to call you in. War Machine, just go. He's like, I'm over here saving other famous classical guitarist, John Williams, from dying. <laughs> so I can't be getting Segovia at the same time. Pretty in pink. He's yeah, the, he's the yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty That's in right. pink. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a point to that. Just that like I was taken aback by, because I remember this movie. I did watch this a lot growing up for some reason. Not that, I mean, I just like didn't remember that I watched it so much until I watched it. And I was like, oh yeah, uh, I've seen this a lot. And I, his energy is almost like a completely different person. Just like the yeah, I think this was a weird. I think this was the end of his young days, and I think he sort of almost disappeared for a while. Yeah, is the feeling I got, and then he started to come back. I remember it was very distracting. One time he was like a one-off character in Seinfeld, and mm. I couldn't tell. I was like, "Has James Spader fallen so far?" Or not that I, I mean, Seinfeld's one of my favorite shows, so I would never uh, begrudge someone. But I was like, has he fallen so far? Or is this like Seinfeld was at its peak? So like James Spader's like, I want to be on. Just give me something yeah, to do. Yeah, come on. Uh, he, of course, played a character who once uh, loaned his sweat or wouldn't loan his sweater to uh, George Costanza, who was cold because he thought that George's head would stretch out the neck hole. And then it turns out he's an alcoholic and he was making amends and he won't make amends to George for that thing. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Oh, it was great. This is also, uh, I'm, I was, I don't think this is hyper gay of a movie. Roland Emmerich is an openly gay director. Okay. It's not a hyper gay movie, but it's not, not a gay movie. There are a lot of hunky. Yeah. Bodyguards. As soon as the like, guards start taking off their masks, you're like, hello. Hello, Anubis. Oh, my stars. <laughs> Horace, <laughs> where did you come from? Mm. Uh, if I could tell you stories about Horace, let me tell you, the girl earns her name. <laughs> Anubis, take out on. the bi and it's anus. <laughs> bi anus is what he should mm-hmm. be called. That's an I don't know anagram. It started out as gay and now it's just turning into Jewish <laughs> grandma. I don't know why <laughs> it transitioned in that way. Uh, but also there's the boys in the town. I don't know any of their names. Yeah. Uh, but there's that weird scene uh, where Kurt Russell is smoking and then the main twink crawls <laughs> in through the window uh, in what... He's wearing, like, a tunic and then little uh, boots that go up to his thighs. But he has... There's a huge UTA, upper thigh area, <laughs> that is visible. Like, his side thigh is, like, visible. It's a very distracting, a teenage yeah. Damon might say, <laughs> outfit. Um, he's got, like, a bare midriff, a skin-tight, like... Uh, tank top and then a big flowy uh, garment on top. Uh, it's very, again, as a teenage man would say, distracting outfit. But there's this weird scene where Kurt Russell is smoking and then Already the gay. boy grabs a cigarette. Right. That's, that's p- first off, pretty gay. <laughs> and then, as uh, Sigmund Freud would tell you, a DJ, mm. sometimes the cigarette's just a cigarette. He wouldn't stop telling me. That's why I killed him. <laughs> but then the boy starts smoking and they're just like smoking and staring at each other. And I'm like, okay, movie, <laughs> let's, let's either t- take this into overdrive or let's cool our jets, <laughs> but I can't have us at this level for any longer. Not a soft core guy. Are you? <laughs> what are we doing well, here? Well, there's also is what I always yell at soft core porn. Of course. Also Ra is androgynous, very androgynous and is surrounded by scantily clad children that are kind of like that he uses as a human shield at one point. And it's very like, yeah. it's, I think it's supposed to be like, this guy's a, this guy's a fucking creep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he, I mean, he kidnaps an Egyptian child to take his body. Yes. Uh, and that's the form we see him in here. And yeah, then he is surrounded by various kids of various ages. Don't say various. Uh, yeah. That's very, uh, I, 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 for some reason their, their outfits look familiar. Like this is what I've seen, like mm. how Egyptian children dress at least in this style with these, these, the hair braids, you know, braids on top of their head and the rest of their head is bald. Um, but yeah, it's very, just, it's very weird and uncomfortable. I kind of want to talk about the, the alien, like raw 
So I want to talk about a raw nonstop, so, but go ahead. So like the general vibe is, and you, you said this in the recap. So he's in like basically the last member of an alien species and he's mm-hmm. dying. He knows he's dying. And so he's zipping around the galaxy trying to not die. So I guess he's a parasite of some sort. So he knows that if he finds some sort of some sort of living creature that he can possess, he knows that he can go on living. And so he comes to does he come to Earth? He comes to Earth first? I'm a little bit confused about where he comes think- to because he takes people are not like originally from this planet and then they seeded earth they're from earth and he took them to this planet because he could use the minerals there to to fuel his technology to build the stargate which he used to get to earth in the first place it's one of those things where the more you think about the more you're like wait what i didn't even think about that but yeah i i think you have uh, the gist right that he found our uh, ancient earth And then kidnapped some of the people there and brought them to this planet. How he did that, I don't know. If he already had a Stargate and he just wanted to build another right. Stargate, it is kind of vague. I mean, I DJ, I've been very clear about that I'm against slavery. Right. Sure, and, sure, sure. Um, I think I was confused. I, can, I think we can as, go ahead and say that the platform generally of this podcast is anti-slavery. Thank yeah, you. Generally. generally. Exceptions are made. Um, Tell me your circumstances. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Six one five five seven six zero five two five. Have a conversation. Text us about it. Um, uh, but look, man, I'm just talking. This is all of a sudden the Joe Rogan podcast. I'm just talking. <laughs> Maybe some situations. You know, I don't know. Elon Musk, what do you think? We're just talking. Um, What's the harm in talking about whether human beings should be enslaved or not? Also, I don't believe in vaccines. <laughs> but what's the harm in asking questions, even though I'm a malinformed person with crazy reach? <laughs> anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there. I was confused as to what the enslaved uh, slaves were <laughs> enslaved to do. I think mine. They're, they're mining these minerals, yeah. but Ra's not even, like, there. Yeah, where does he go? Because he... so. Is he in Miami all they, this time? They, the, the Earthlings, our heroes, our team, our squad, come through the Stargate, and Ra is not there. And then as some of them are stationed at the pyramid while Jackson and some others have gone into the local city, they've, they've encountered the locals and start to like uh, go there, that's when... Sharing their Fifth Avenue right. bars like crazy. <laughs> that's when Ra's spaceship pyramid hat comes down <laughs> the uh, the pyramid chapeau if you will comes down onto the the pyramid and but you're like i don't understand where he went was what is he why is this he has established himself as the ruler king of this planet with earthlings that he's enslaved from earth but like where what like i to what end i mean to to live forever but he's still possessing the first guy he possessed. So, like, how does that work? And why does he need all these other yeah. people? I don't... Why do you need all these kids? Yeah, why do you need all these... Mine, you have a Stargate here and on Earth. What are you doing with all your time? <laughs> and he, apparently, you know, he, he is living forever, but he doesn't seem to be... I don't know. He, is he enjoying it? <laughs> DJ, let me ask you this. Is he surviving or is he thriving? What's the po- I think he's just surviving. What's the point of living? <laughs> if you ain't living large. I think I would say Let- he is living large, though. He's living in a... No, I mean, he's got, I, I was curious about who dry cleans all those, um, those curtains he yeah. has on his, his space pyramid. It's alien technology. It doesn't need to be dry cleaned. Well, now that's the technology we need. You're over here curing cancer. I want curtains. <laughs> I don't have to dry clean. <laughs> so here's a note I have, and I think I know what this is about. So... When we encounter Ra's army of twonks, um, they wear these these giant helmets yeah. that uh, reminded me of Big Bird a little bit, <laughs> and that you know Carol Spinney had to hold his arm yeah. up like all the time when their their heads are like a foot above their actual head when you take the mask off. So I'm like, is it like a Mickey Mouse at Disney World situation where there's like a little like mesh slit in the neck of Anubis <laughs> where they can see out of? It seems like a really weird way to it's do it. It's got a, a little, a little uh, periscope in it. <laughs> <laughs> 
But it was very confusing. But they, of course, look like the Egyptian gods. Right. So you have Anubis and Horus uh, with a bird-like hat and a, a dog, a jackal-like uh, hat, hat head. And but then there's like a little button. On the on the collar, yeah. you hit the button, and the mask like <laughs> falls down, um, and then like sort of disappears CGI wise behind their head. Yeah. And my note was just, but where do the masks dot 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 go? <laughs> Alien technology, man. Just, like, Don't worry about it. D- it's like it's it like uh, on itself. Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny pulls a mallet from behind his <laughs> back. It just makes the, like there's nowhere for the mask to actually go. It goes away. <laughs> no need she knows that i feel like even though these are uh, at first i thought these were an alien race it turns out to be human so it kind of makes more sense but this is like still pretty racist <laughs> just like the very idea that there's this like primitive culture that we're like that they're like kind of idiots and they're like it's all just the whole thing is very is, imperialistic uh, mindset not good yeah. I wrote my last note here is white saviors. Yeah, yeah. These mostly white people come to space Egypt, save all the space slaves from the space god, who is an actual god of Egypt. So it saves them from their own god uh, that frees them, and then they go home. Yeah. And oh, but James Spader gets to marry the the woman who can barely speak. Uh, oh, his that's line, a whole other who thing. Can't speak like our language. one. There's a whole like exotic woman yeah. v- vibe, and he like marries her because her father like gives him to her as a gift, and it's like I the movie's like well it's cool because they actually fell in love. Just little, and I'm yeah. like it's is it cool though? Movie? Well, and after the you know in the in the um, first act we get a little bit of we get some other women, but th- otherwise she's the only woman in this entire. She, it's movie. it's the Smurfette situation. Yeah. <laughs> Do we get other women? Well, we got the uh, the the rich enigmatic, and we get uh, uh, <laughs> don't forget uh, Barbara Shore. Hi, <laughs> is that Barbara? Is that Mrs. Sokol from also from Seinfeld? Who oh, Barbara Shore? Hi, yeah, the woman who works with Richard Kind. She's like an older woman. She has glasses. You mean Barbara Shore? Hi, uh, yeah, Barbara Shore. Hi, <laughs> I don't know. Is that her? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's not important. <laughs> Uh, hold also, on. I want to know what happens important. to Richard Kind's character. I think we probably find out in one of the other Stargates. You know, they. T- I'm sure it's co- actually he does pop up in I one of the other it. Stargates. I looked it up. I looked it up to see <laughs> who like came on to any of the other Stargate shows, of which there are. Look, I know a fan asked us to watch Stargate, and he also said we should watch the shows. There are so many shows. I think as- there's Stargate SG One, yeah. there's Stargate Atlantis, there's Stargate Continuum, and there was something called Stargate Colon Origins Colon Catherine. Which led me to believe there must be other Stargate colon origins colons out there for me to to watch. I feel like I feel like Stargate SG One is fair game, but the rest of them you're gonna have to everybody you're gonna have to do that on your own time. <laughs> <laughs> SG One had a lot more of a cultural impact because it went ran for so long and was like I think it was more popular than this movie even, even though this is a pretty big hit. I'm surprised they didn't do more big budget movies after this one. I mean, I guess, I, you know, 94 was a little bit before the sequel explosion, but it was enough that I'm, you know, of a hit that I'm surprised they didn't do more. Maybe, maybe it just didn't work out or they made a deal with making the series that they're like, you can't do more movies or something. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I think this was before the, uh, this was the age when it was like, okay, you had your fun. You had a popular movie. Get, get. <laughs> the fact that they made a uh, six thousand other shows uh, in, it is was also like I never watched the shows even I, though I watched. I've never seen uh, SG. I liked Stargate. Yeah. as a kid, uh, but for some reason I also have a weird thing about recasting people. Yeah, and for some reason it like sticks in my craw. I'm like I can't buy that uh, MacGyver is you know also Snake. They're the same person. I can't buy that. <laughs> By the way, uh, Ray Allen is the character actress who plays both Mrs. Sokol in Seinfeld uh, at the unemployment office that George Costanza is trying to scheme against. And she also plays Barbara Shaw. Hi. <laughs> she also plays Ma Keller in A League of Their Own. Oh. Uh, can we talk about Ra now? Yes, please. Does Ra, the character, suck? I kind of like feel like the movie like built him up uh, big time. Yeah, and then when we finally meet him, 
I feel like his costumes are wearing him. <laughs> I think that he is so... I don't think that Jay Davidson may not be a good actor. And so, uh, on top of which, I mean, not that he doesn't have, like, a tall order, because he's all his lines are in a fake language right. that he did not understand. Right. And on top of that, his voice is altered right. to right. be, like, super deep and... and Demon-esque. Creaky, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, it's so working against him, but I also suspect he's all glowers and no... Uh, no meat. It's all. It's a very stereotypical villain in the sense that he's like, now I'm going to destroy Earth. Thanks for opening the Stargate. Now I get to destroy Earth again, even though I probably could have opened it up because I'm the one that built it in the first place. But I kind of forgot. I forgot my keys. Is Did you guys find my that keys? He, that he felt the Stargate open and he That's came back? That's possible. But where was he? Well, I mean, yeah, where was he? But also, like, why did he show up just suddenly on the two days that these people were Listen, here? We established he was in Miami. And as far as I'm concerned, that is <laughs> that is canon. Buenvenido a Miami. Yeah. I, I decided that I think, uh, well, one, the, mo- the only acceptable form of homophobia for me is Disney villain homophobia, where the Disney villain is coded as gay. That's the only one I can accept. <laughs> and I kind of wanted Ra to be Disney villain. You wanted him to break into song. I wanted him to break into song. I wanted him to be like Scar or like Ursula. I wanted him to just like be completely Poor off the wall. Souls. <laughs> and I feel like that that I have a sense that a Roland Emmerich also wanted him to do that. Um, he was more and like the most that Jay Davidson could muster was cocking an eyebrow every once in a while during a line read. He was more like Sigourney Weaver as Dana as Zool. Just kind of like there is no Dana only vaguely. No, she's great. Yeah, yeah, no, she. But like, but she's got that great dress. <laughs> so yeah, he had dresses. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I, they didn't do that much with him. He did. He was like you know. He did like kill his own guard, but he and he did like attack his people. And he's only got like five guards. Like Ra, do the numbers. I, that's the other thing I don't understand. Is I think maybe you know it was just a maybe a budget thing or something they decided they spent all their money on the the uh the rebellion crowd that they couldn't get him a, an army but it seems like he has well, according to the trivia they also couldn't pay for the rebellion yeah. crowd because some of those were scarecrows but it seems like he has an army no because <laughs> this is my favorite bit of trivia i right. think we've ever encountered on this show <laughs> who who's flying the ships when he sends ships to attack the city from what I can tell, it's the, it's 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 those guys. It's the 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 Anubis heads. Anubis is the so bird, he has right? two guards. No, he has well, he has he like had, four. He had Jaiman Hansu. Yeah, um, he had the the really hot one. Um, who, oh, that's true. He had uh, like six or name. something, and then they they lost a few. And by the end, he only has two, and then they die too. And again, I I cannot stress this enough. I'm very anti-slavery, but I really <laughs> have to <laughs> hand it to Ra that he was able to enslave an entire planet with a crew. Of a basketball team. It's just a slim workforce. That's a slim, (laughs) nimble workforce. You know, if productivity is up and, you know, morale is up, we've got all these kids. They're not doing anything, but they're keeping everyone's spirits up. They're buoying everyone's uh, morale. And, you know, we can just keep keep this whole planet enslaved with just a a skeleton crew. Just a skeleton crew. You know that uh, levitation slinky? That's that's automation. It's coming for you workers. Oh, uh, yeah. there used to be a guy who actually ran the, they had the like slinky. a dumb waiter. He would make small talk with you. Oh, it was terrible. Just a dumb waiter to the spaceship. <laughs> oh, you're going, you're going down to the earth pyramid. You're going to go see all the slaves. Come back down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hit six shifts. Um, I don't know. Rod just like, I feel like his buildup and then uh, followed by his actual scheming and villainy was kind of, I don't even mind the mwahaha like stuff. I just feel like the line readings were not good. I my And so I, he just didn't feel like a fully fleshed out character on top of which, like all those other things were working against him. I think most, most of my issues come from sort of getting, you know how, like, like I said, if you give me a little bit of an explanation goes a long way in a sci-fi movie, it was like not quite enough for me. Cause I'm like the story of, uh, you know, an alien near death and look, okay, I, I'm, that's all cool. He actually is what earth come, came to think of as raw. Okay. That's actually really cool. And then it's like, wait, what? Like, if you think about it for just about five seconds you start to go i don't understand the mechanics of this 
of these evil machinations. And right. It seems like a lot of work for, <laughs> you know, for what? Stars gates? Star, star, stars gate. No, it's, it's like antennae. So it's like star get a, <laughs> and we never even see other, I mean, we just see the one star get, there's no one building anything. They're just mining things. So is there another planet full of people building things? You know, um, and the shipping it sounds like we need more uh, information and maybe like a maybe like a six or seven yeah, series, nine, nine or ten thousand uh, more episodes about what are the possibilities there with Star Mac Gates's <laughs> Star Mac Gates with all his children around him. Want to go to the bird? I don't mind that you have the p- the children on this this spaceship, but the fact that you traffic them to another planet that's yeah, the that's the problem. In. Jesus Christ! Um, do you want to go to the verdict? Uh, yeah. Here we go. Through the Stargate. <laughs> well, well. Through the Stargate to the verdict. Damon Xanthopoulos, tell me your verdict, please. Uh, I will say your inner child is not an idiot. Whoa! Um, just barely. Your paws I feel like made me think you were going to say we were. Just over the line. Just a toe over the line. This, I can understand, there's enough information, like enough like hand wavy information that I can understand making better shows from this, or at least more explained and thorough shows from this. Mm-hmm. Not that I've seen SGM one, I can't speak to their quality, but I can I can see how someone would be able to take this idea and run, kind of like Buffy the Vampire Slayer or something. Right. But I don't know. This there there was a. It felt like this movie sometimes was impersonating, or almost was like relying on me to fill in the blanks from better movies. Yeah, like right. especially that first third of the movie where it's like you've seen this kind of crap where the military's doing stuff like this, right? <laughs> that happens. And like right? there's there's like a smart archaeologist and he's like able to figure stuff out uh, that other people can't. You know that crap, right? <laughs> fill in the rest. And then I, I kind of was into it once we got to the. The Space Egypt, because I love a revolution story, you, no matter how stupid it is. And this one's pretty stupid. Um, <laughs> I don't understand. I don't understand what the scheme is for enslaving all these space aliens or space Egyptians. I don't understand. Does is is Ra never here? So is. I mean, they don't seem to be ever working. Like, they're always just, like, in town, like, hanging out, getting lighters from Kurt Russell. So <laughs> what is the terms of this enslavement? Is it, is it kind of like Anakin and Mom in, in episode one, where they're just sort of like, we're slaves. Now let's go home because the work day is over. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think I understand what the terms of this enslavement are. But, yeah, I mean, it was just enough fun like, kind of stupid, like, I can, you know, I think I said in the introduction that this is a movie I catch on Saturday afternoons a lot in the 2000s and the late 90s, where it's just fun enough that I want to, I kind of like it. I wish, I wish Ra was super gay, though. (laughs) Like, not just one notch gay, like, five or six notches gay. Like, really lean into it. it. But I wish he didn't. If he was super gay, I wish the kids were then removed. From the <laughs> good, equation, good, good, good. Because that's we weird. don't need that. This movie is a bit racist. It's definitely mm. sexist. It mm. many of the characters are thinly drawn. It has pretty thin plot. Like where you start asking too many questions, it starts to be like well, that doesn't make any sense. But. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, what a lead-in. Despite the racism. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Your inner child is not an idiot. It was, it's pretty fun. I think the goodwill that the first two-thirds of the movie creates, either by actually doing its own thing or by recalling slightly better movies or way better movies, does carry it through a wobbly third act for me, where it was just like, what exactly are we doing here? And then kind of like carries it to the end. And I I think I really like the music. I thought it was great. The music is pretty good, but it also felt like music that was impersonating other music. (laughs) 
like other movie soundtracks. So it felt like it felt like the platonic form of a yeah. this type of movie soundtrack. Well, it's, yeah, so it's David Arnold. Ba-na-na-na-na. Yeah, he's no, that's that's the Jurassic Park score, but still, you get the he's idea. He's definitely. Uh, channeling john williams but it's like he this same guy david arnold did the music for independence day and it's like Mm -hmm. um it is it is like evocative it's evocative of other music but it is evocative of like adventure stories and uh i thought it carried a lot it helped set the scene like if you didn't have that kind of score like if they decided to do something like you know like 90s keyboards or something instead it would have it, I may I may not feel the same way. It may have actually been enough to help turn the movie, like where I'm just like, it gives you the right vibe. And, you know, Spader's charming. Kurt Russell is not charming in this. His character is not charming, but also he's not yeah, that we charming. We don't really talk about that. He's, he's, ter- he's not terrible in this movie. He feels like a very believable character, yeah. but the movie plot progresses in a way that makes me think that there's been some change in his character, right. but he just seems like a dick the entire time. And when he has like this goodbye with James Spader, where it's like, I'm supposed to think they're friends. I'm like, when did they become friends? Right. They seem to hate each other throughout the movie. Don't understand. Why? Well, it's just like at the very end when he uses the bomb, he agrees to use the bomb to blow up. That was like his final achievement because right. he was still going to blow up the Stargate, which... It was kind of funny because, you know, James Spader is this, like, the science character who's like, you know, you can't blow it up. He's, like, immediately like, yeah, obviously blow it up, but let's get out of here first. And it was like, wait, what? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It was, um, it's not, it's definitely not a perfect movie, but I think if you're like me and you watch this a bunch growing up or like you did uh, watching it on Saturday mornings, like, I don't think you're going to come back and be like, oh, this is a piece of shit. You're going to be like, oh yeah, I remember that. Ooh, that's, uh, that's not great. But you're, it's not I mean, like a horrible problematic. I mean, it is, it has problems. Oh no, it's, it's kind of problem. <laughs> it, it has, it has problematic moments for sure, but it's not. I mean, the problematicness is like on the level, of, I would say of Indiana Jones, where yeah. brown people are just sort of used as props yes, throughout the movie absolutely. Uh, to forward the story of these white saviors. Yeah. It's yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not great, right. but uh, I feel like it's a type of movie that we, because you know, movies are just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, or they become smaller and go to TV or get, you know, released on, on video on demand. Uh, but there's like this middle rung of like action movies. This just sort of like by the book sort of action movie that was made like really big in the nineties. And it's that type of movie that just doesn't exist anymore. Right. As, as prominently as it used to be. What do you think, everybody? Call us to Texas, 615-576-0525. We want to thank our patrons, including Tyler Richardson. The supreme ruler of this podcast. Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Karen Curd. Lindsay Nell. Jonathan Day. Just Cuz. The Zesty. Jacob Grimm. Particle Man. These are all in uh, showery uh, accents now, by the way. Uh, Damon's Australian accent. Adar Togul. I can't, I can't with this. Is that <laughs> is that racist, even though it's a made-up language? <laughs> it feels not not racist. Dramatically placed hot dog. Larissa Mestro. T. Smith. Jeremy Paulin. Kevin from Cleveland. Ah, the Cleave. Ah, uh, Fleet of the Cleave. Brandon Hardy. His Honor the Mayor. Dan Mackin. Tire. And Justin Shea, thank you all very, very, very much. We really appreciate your support. If you want to support like them, patreon.com slash you're child's an idiot. Do you want to, hold on, uh, do you want to know the trick of just doing anyone's name in the Stargate accent? Yes. You just add an apostrophe in there. Oh. So like, so like, uh, David Schumer. Exactly. (laughs) David Schwimmer? Julie Andrews. <laughs> Wait, now it sounds Irish Doesn't and it? aggressive. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, my friend Russ Weaver for the use of his song "Top of Two for our ad music. And now, uh, and now, Damon and I are going to go through a wormhole back to our uh, respective lives. <laughs> Why did the wormhole I, only have a top and a bottom? I did. I did notice that on my second viewing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why that would be the case. Does uh, my esophagus only have a top and a bottom? Oh yeah, if stuff if stuff goes the wrong <laughs> way, it just pops into your